In this video, we're going to be covering Timescale DB from an algorithmic trading point of view. It's a very common requirement or next step when you're getting into algo trading that you'll begin to host your own database where you'll store your collection of data for whatever asset you might be trading. The reason being that you can query that data an unlimited amount of times. You don't have to worry about being rate limited. And it also cuts out a significant amount of latency, especially if your data provider servers are in a different continent to yours. That can really add several seconds even of lag when making a request, which in algo trading can make all the difference as far as your order execution goes. So what is Timescale DB? It's an add-on for Postgres, which is a popular open source database that's been running for more than 30 years at this point. And so Timescale DB is an extension to Postgres that makes it more suitable for time series data like stock market data, crypto price data, etc, etc. It's also widely used for other time series like say weather data, temperature readings, readings from industrial plants and factories and things like that. But obviously we're more concerned about the stock market performance. So why are we using Timescale? Well, as I said, it's optimized for time series data, which is what we're going to be storing. And in particular, it has two really nice features that we're going to be using in this video. The first of them is a concept called a hyper table. So you might be familiar with tables in databases. You just have a you know, schema. You have one column with the symbol, one column with the price, etc., etc. Well, the problem with that is if you have gigabytes and gigabytes or even terabytes of data, it's going to be extremely difficult for the database to load that all into memory if it's a traditional relational database like Postgres. What Timescale does is it creates something called a hyper table. So it splits up your main table into chunks behind the scenes that are in chunks of time. So the default length is one week. So it'll break up all of your data into one week chunks. And that way, if I do a request, let's say for a particular date range, it only has to grab maybe one or two chunks and load that into memory. And if you're working in memory in your database, things are going to be a lot faster than if it has to keep loading and unloading from memory to disk. The second really killer feature, which I really, really like is the continuous aggregates feature. So what this does is it allows you to create some sort of query and have that run constantly in the background at regular intervals and to refresh itself when new data is added. So in this video, we're going to be streaming crypto trade data, so trades as they take place on the Binance exchange, we're going to be streaming that data to Timescale DB, and the continuous aggregate will transform that into open high low close candles for whatever kind of time frame that we require. And it'll make sure that whenever we request those candles, they're up to date to the most recent tick. And it saves us a lot of computation over the long run because all of this is being done in the background and we don't have to aggregate all the time or schedule these queries manually. It's a really, really cool feature and it's something we'll be getting into shortly. So what are we going to be doing with Timescale DB? Well, as I mentioned, we're first going to be streaming trade data from Binance. So as each individual trade happens on Binance for specific pairs that we're interested in, we're going to receive that data and insert that straight into our database. I'm also going to show you how we can set up the continuous aggregates to aggregate all that data into our candlesticks from where we can think about generating indicators and that kind of thing. And then finally, I'll show you how to integrate this with Python in that I'll show you how you can query the data from the database and how you can integrate that into a trading bot. So I'll be using the example in one of my previous videos, the code for which will be in the description in one of the blog posts. You don't have to follow along with my code, of course. You can just practice doing the queries in whatever kind of trading framework you've already got set up. And for Binance, you don't need an account for anything. We're just going to be using the testnet. 
which we can easily convert to streaming live data just by putting some real API keys in. Chapters are in the description for each of these sections if you're just interested in one or the other. And so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started into this deep dive into TimescaleDB. To get started, the first thing we'll want to do is to go ahead and install TimescaleDB. Now, the method that I would really encourage you to use is the Docker method here, where you'll pull a Docker image and just run that. You can just install it on your system as an add-on to a Postgres database that you've got, but then you have to worry about keeping Postgres up to date with the timescale version that you're using and just lots of compatibility issues. So if you don't have Docker, do go ahead and install that. It's available on all systems, so the installation procedure for the container here should be relatively similar. All you have to do to get something running is you just open up a command line window and you can just paste in this command here. And what this will do, this will pull the latest version of timescale down to your system. So I should probably have it installed already. And then we just scroll down here and then we can start our container here with docker run slash d for detached mode. So it's not in our current terminal session. Name, just give it a name, so I'll call mine tutorial. And then you want to give it a port. So the generic port that most database applications use is 5432, or at least Postgres does. So 5432, and then we give the mapping of that port inside the container, 5432. And then we give it some environmental variables here. So you'll see the main one is just to give it a password here. You don't technically have to do that, but you'll want to make sure that no one else can access it, obviously. So you could lock it down by just binding to your home IP here, but we can just give it some random passwords. So if I open up a password generator here, say this. And then finally, we we'll want to give it the name of the Docker image that we actually want to start inside a container. So if I just, I'll maximize this here. This is the container image that we pulled. So I'll just copy and paste that down here. So there we go. That command should work. I already have a container name tutorial when I was practicing. So let's name it tutorial two. There we go. Now, if I run docker ps, I can now see that I've got a timescale container here that's running and active, and we should be able to connect to that now. One thing to note, if you're perhaps a little bit unfamiliar with Docker, is that when you restart your system or otherwise close down this container here, it won't appear when you type docker ps and it won't automatically restart back up when you reboot the system. If you get any errors concerning that, that your database is not active, you'll want to check here. So I'm just gonna close this container down here just to show you. So if I do docker stop tutorial two, we now see when I do a docker ps, it doesn't appear. You have to use docker ps a, and that will show you the list of Docker containers that I've closed. To start it up again is real easy. All you have to do is say docker start and then the name, so tutorial two in my case, and that'll go ahead and start it up again. All of the data is preserved between opening and closing the container. So you don't have to worry about data loss for your database or anything like that. It's just that if you are rebooting your system, make sure that it's actually up and running. So that's great. We've got our Docker container running here with Timescale DB. We've got it installed on our system. How do we go about pulling data from Binance? Well, I recommend heading on over to the testnet website. So if you go to testnet.binance.vision, you'll find a link here to log in with GitHub. And then once you do that, you'll be able to generate an API key here. I'm using this in this particular tutorial because obviously not everyone has a Binance account, but they still might want to follow along with the tutorial. 
Now the data that we get from the test network isn't going to be very good. But you can use the exact same code that I'm showing you in this video and just replace these API keys with your real API keys from your actual Binance account. So I'm just going to generate some keys here. And I'll just call this, uh, I guess, bot tutorial four, since that seems to be the naming scheme we're going with here. Okay, so I'll write these down in an extremely secure notepad. Obviously, if you're using real API keys, please make sure never to show these to anyone. Um, and I guess I'll also write down our Docker password from earlier. This file here is going to be quite important because it's how our Python script is going to be able to retrieve passwords that we need, but we obviously don't want to store those in code. So speaking of not storing passwords in code, let's go ahead and get started here. So I'll just create a file here and I'll call it tutorial.py. Now the first module I'm actually going to import here doesn't really have much to do with Binance, but it's very important if you're going to be doing anything with sensitive information like API keys. It's going to be Python decouple. So I'll do from decouple import config. So I'll have to go ahead and install that. So I'll create a virtual environment here so I can show you which packages that we need exactly. And then I'll activate that. So for now, the two packages that we really need are Python decouple, Python decouple. That's going to be managing our API keys for us in a safe way. And we also need Python Binance. That's obviously going to be interacting with Binance for us. So let's go ahead and install those. Now that that's done, I'll show you how we're actually going to use this Python decouple module here. So if I load up this folder here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a document and I'm going to call it .env. That's the default name that Python decouple looks for. I think you might be able to change it, but it doesn't really matter too much. And what I'm going to put in here is I'm just going to set some variables basically. So in here, I'm just going to say API underscore key is equal to this value. And then I'll say secrets key is equal to this value. And then we'll say db underscore pass is equal to this value. So I'll close this one down now. And if you were going to be pushing this code to a repo, as you might well do if you're developing some kind of trading system, please do make sure that this file is in your git ignore file. So it doesn't get pushed up to GitHub. That would defeat the whole point of having it separated. So we've got that now. We don't really need to keep that open. And we can get back to our Python here. So let's open that up. And now what we can do is we can print out the values here. So if we print config and then we just give it the name of the variable. So let's say API key. And what that'll do is it'll print that out for us. So it's a really nice way to just keep sensitive information separate from your Python scripts. So you can easily share your code with people and you don't have to worry about redacting all the information. So we've got that. Now let's just set some variables here, API key and API secret. So API key is equal to config API key. And then we'll do the same thing with the secret here. And API secret. And at this point, we're actually ready to start connecting to the Binance API. So if you go on over to the Binance Python website here, you see there's a section on WebSockets. Essentially, the code that we're going to be going through is just a doctored version of this, where we'll change the handler here to be specific to timescale and inserting data into a database. We're going to be using the threaded approach here because async IO can be scary sometimes. But if you want to dive further into the documentation, here it is, and you can look at things like using a different top level domain if you trade on Binance.us instead of Binance.com or something like that. So in here, let's create our main function here. So def main 
So let's go ahead and just boot up a really simple example here. So we'll just give it a single symbol for now, but I'll be showing you how to add multiple symbols in a second. So we'll do ETH BTC. You can pick pretty much any pair on the Binance exchange and it should work. Just make sure, say if you were trading ETH USD, make sure you do ETH USDT or USDC, since I think Binance doesn't officially have a USD pair yet. Let's go ahead and create a threaded WebSocket manager. So that's going to be just managing all our different WebSockets here. So we say TWM is equal to threaded WebSockets manager. And then we'll pass in our API keys here with our fancy variables up there. So API key is equal to API underscore key and API secrets is equal to API secret. So just to be clear, these are the first ones here are parameters in this function that we need to set. And the second one matches to our variable here. Slightly confusing that they, they're the exact same names, but it's just standard Python naming convention to name variables like that. After the WebSocket manager is created, we've given it our credentials. We'll be able to give it a start here. Now, if you were to run this, it wouldn't actually do anything really because we haven't given it any WebSockets to connect to. The way you do that is you go ahead and add a type of socket. So the type I'm going to be using is a trade socket. There are lots of different ones you can get, say, like market depth, or if you're using real API keys, you can get things like a list of your own trades that have gone through. But to create a simple trade socket here, we just use our threaded WebSocket Manager object and we call it start underscore trade underscore socket on it. Now this takes two parameters. The first one is a callback function, which I'll explain in a second. I'll just leave that blank for now. And the second one is just a symbol that we want. So that's fairly self-explanatory. Symbol is going to be equal to symbol. So the callback function here is just going to be telling the WebSocket manager here what we want to do when we receive a trade. So it'll be listening for trades from the Binance exchange. What do we actually want to do when we get a trade coming through? So we create a function here and we'll just call it like handle message and it'll take message as a parameter and we're just gonna print it out, print message. And so that's going to be the function here that we use to handle the message. So we'll just say handle underscore message. So now whenever it receives a trade, it will use this function to deal with it. The final thing we have to do is to join our thread here. So twm.join. Make sure if you're defining other sockets here. So if you do something like this and you have a, a different symbol, Make sure that join is at the end here because join will basically block everything after it from running until the WebSocket's finished. But the WebSocket is designed to run all the time, so it won't actually run any of the code below here. So I think that's good enough for a real simple example here. So we'll say if name is equal to main, and then run main. So this piece of code here is just a very common Python snippet. It basically means if we're just running this particular Python file on its own and we're not importing it as part of a library, then run main. But if we are just, say, importing this file, then don't run it. That's all that means. If I've typed everything up correctly, this should run when I press go. Looks like I've mistyped one of my config parameters here. I think it might be secret underscore key. And if I run it now, we haven't actually imported the WebSocket manager. That might be quite useful. So we'll import that here. From Binance, import threaded web sockets manager. All right, we should be good now. So here are all the different trades coming in. Again, this is testnet data, so the 
actual price here might be some way off what the actual values are. The reliability of the testnet can vary quite a lot. But nonetheless, we are actually getting some form of trade data in here. You can cancel with Control C. Or you might have to press it a few times. I think if you press it twice, it eventually works. If you just Control C once, it thinks it's been disconnected, so it tries to reconnect. But if you Control C twice, that usually gets rid of it. So if we go back and look at some of these trades here, some of these are fairly easy to work out. So for example, T is, is probably some kind of time, P is price, S is symbol. But the layout can be a bit cryptic, so I made a nice little thing here on the blog, which you can also find in the API documentation. But essentially the only things that we really care about is the price, the quantity, and the trade time, as well as the symbol. Those are the only four things that I'm going to be saving down. You can choose to save all the data if you want. I'll show you how to do that as well. So now that we've got data for one symbol, how can we do it for multiple symbols? Well, one way of doing it is actually just to start another trade socket here. So you can do something like this and you can say instead of that, you'd say like BTC USDT. And that should basically work. And if we wait a few seconds here, you can see quite a few trades BTC USDT and some of them are ETH BTC. So that works great. Problem there being that it'll look somewhat messy if you're going to have loads of these lines here. You know, maybe you could reduce it down to a for loop, but Python Binance provides a really nice function called a multiplex socket. It's a very fancy sounding name. And what that can do is it can start multiple types of socket and multiple sockets by just passing in a list of the different trade streams that we want to subscribe to. So to do that, it's relatively similar to the thing we've got here, except that instead of symbol, we create a variable called streams. Well, it doesn't have to be called streams. It can be called anything you like. And it's just going to be a list. So we give a list here and I'd give, say, ADA BTC, something like that. Just a different crypto pair there. And then instead of starting a trade socket here, we start a multiplex socket. So twm dot start underscore multiplex underscore sockets. Same thing, we give the callback function. And that's going to be equal to handle underscore message. And then we hand in the list of streams here. So streams is equal to stream. And then everything else is exactly the same. We still join onto the thread and everything else is fine. So we'll also want to change the format slightly of our symbols here. So the format for the trade socket and all the other single kinds of sockets are just capital letters like this, the trading pair. For the multiplex socket, you provide it in a different manner. So you do something like ETH BTC at trade. And then you do the same thing here, ADA. BTC at trade. So obviously this is your pair and then this is the socket that you'd like to connect to. There are lots of different ones that you can connect to. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I don't know. Let's say there's a um, book, for example, to get the orders as they're coming in. And that would subscribe to that web socket rather than the trade web socket. You can find those on the Binance documentation. There should be a good list of them somewhere. So let's run this and see how it works. So as you can see, we're getting trades for both ADA and ETH. So life is good. Now this is great. We've got all of our trades printing out to the screen, but how do we actually get these into timescale itself? So for that, we're going to be using a slightly bizarrely named module called psycho PG two. That's apparently the library that's commonly used in Python to interact with Postgres based database systems. And to install it, you use pip install and then ps, so it's psycopg2. And then to actually install it, you want to use a dash binary option. If you don't include that, I think it'll start trying to build it from scratch on your system, which may or may not work. So I'd recommend just using the binary here and just installing that, and that should work great. Now, in order to actually insert the data into a database, 
we need to actually create a hyper table. So if you remember, I talked about hyper tables earlier. And in order to create a hyper table, we first have to create a regular Postgres table. So in order to do that, just pull up a command line window. And if you followed along with the tutorial and you use Docker, you'll be able to use a Docker command here to quickly get into the PSQL terminal. Obviously, if you're using some other kind of install, I'm sure you can figure it out. So the command we'll be using is just docker exec it for interactive terminal, then the name of your container. So mine's going to be tutorial two. And then the command that you want to run. So I'm going to run PSQL as the Postgres user. If everything's gone well there, you should see your terminal prompt here change to Postgres. That means we're actually inside Postgres now. So if you get that prompt, we're in the right place. Now let's go ahead and create a regular Postgres table here. Don't worry too much about the syntax in this part if you're not familiar with it. We only have to do this once. Once we've created the table, you can use it as many times as you like. So create table if not exists, fairly straightforward. Then we give it a name. So I'm gonna call mine raw trade data. Then we open up our bracket here. And on the next line, we're gonna provide the schema essentially. So on each line, we'll provide a different column and the type of that column and any restrictions that we want to put on it. So the first column is gonna be time and it's gonna be a timestamp format. In particular, without time zone and it's gonna be not null. So not null just means that you can't insert null data into there. So if I tried to do an insert and there was no data in the time column, it would just reject it, it wouldn't allow that. The next one is just gonna be the symbol, which is just a text format. So symbol, text, and not null again. We don't want to allow null symbols. Then the price, so that's gonna be a double precision we might not necessarily need this amount of precision but generally better to have too much than too little and not null again and then finally I'm going to have the quantity in here so that's going to be a double precision again and not null you can add more columns in if you like. We are receiving more data than this, but these are the only columns that I'm particularly interested in saving down. To close that out, you can just close the bracket and then do a semicolon. And if I click enter, that has actually created our table. That's great. Normally these things don't work first time. You have to mess around with a bit. Um, so if I run slash DT here, that will now pull up our new table. So we're not gonna be interacting with this table directly, rather we're gonna be creating a hyper table based on this table, which we're actually gonna interact with. So to create the hyper table, actually pretty easy once you've made the table itself, you just need to use this command here. So it's select create underscore hyper table. Then you want to provide the table name. So it's gonna be raw trade data in my case. And then you want to specify the name of the time column. So remember, time scale is optimized for time series databases. So you need to provide a column here where the time is stored. You don't have to store it as a timestamp like I've done here. You could store it as an integer if you wanted. That'd be a perfectly valid way of doing things. But my time column is timestamped and it's called time. So I'll set that variable there. And all things being well, that should run. Do remember to put a semicolon at the end of your Postgres commands, otherwise it won't work. So there we go, and that looks like it's created the hyper table there. So that should be us done in Postgres. We won't have to mess around with this much more. I'll leave the window open here because in a second, once we've inserted the data, I'll just show you some quick queries for how you can look at the data, but I'll close this tab out for now. We'll now want to move on to our configuration here. 
So if I go in my end file here, I just need to remember that this is called DB pass. And then if I go down here, let's create a new one and I'll call it DB underscore pass. And that's going to be config DB underscore pass. So we've loaded our password into Python here as a variable. And let's go ahead and start the connection. So we'll need to import psychopg2. And then we'll create a connection here. So we'll say connection is equal to psychopg2.connect. And then we just need to provide all of our information here. So our user is just going to be Postgres. These are all the Docker defaults I'm listing here. So if you use Docker to install it, they should be exactly the same. The password is going to be whatever you set it as. So that I'm just going to grab that from our variable here, DB pass. The host is just going to be our local host, unless you know you're doing this in some kind of remote server. So not 0.1. The port is 5432. As we listed earlier, you can always go back and check your Docker run command if you're not sure which one you set it to. And then the database here is also going to be Postgres. That's just the default value. And I believe there should only be one database in the default installation here of Timescale. So once we've got that connection, we've passed in our details. Let's create a cursor which is an object that we'll be using to actually interact with the database. So we'll be using this cursor to insert stuff later on. What cursor. And there we go, we've instantiated this cursor. So the final thing here in order to get this whole system to work is we just have to modify our callback function. So if you remember, this function receives the message and currently it just prints it out. Now we wanna change that obviously. So let's pass in our cursor here. So if I run this here, we'll just look at the data format again and just get a feeling for how we're gonna actually access it. So if I press Control C, or if I just highlight here, you can see there's two attributes here which we can directly index into. So there's stream and data. So we're gonna to want to index into data and then from there, we can access the rest of the attributes. So let's do that. Control C twice. And we'll convert message here into an indexed version of it. So we'll say message is equal to message data. So if we run that, we should now just get the pertinent data that we're interested in. That looks good to me. What we now need to do is we need to create a query. So I'm going to call it query is equal to. So this is just going to be standard SQL syntax here for inserting things. So insert into then the name of your table. So mine's raw trade data. Then you want to list the columns in the order that we're inserting into them. So I'm going to use time, then symbol then price, then quantity. These queries can get quite long, so you might want to continue them on an alternate line by doing something like that. And then we want to actually provide the values, so values. And then the way that PsychoPG does this is we actually provide like a placeholder here, so just percent lowercase s. And when we actually insert the data into the database, it will just replace the values here with the requisite values. I think this functionality is so that we're less viable to SQL injection or some other kind of flaw in our program. It's essentially some kind of safety protocol, but not too important when it's just us accessing it. But if you had some end users doing queries and that kind of thing, we'd want to check the parameters before we inserted them. So we've got this, now we actually need to create these four parameters that we're going to insert. So we need the time. Remember, we have it in timestamp format, so we'll need to do that. And then we need to insert these other three quantities. So to create the timestamp, I'm going to import date time. 
And then I can go ahead and just grab the timestamp from the messages that we're receiving. So if I go back to a blog post here, we can see that capital T here gives us the trade epoch time. So if I go ahead and say, Timestamp is equal to date time dot date time dot from timestamp. And then in here, we can put our timestamp. Now, Binance gives the timestamp in nanoseconds, I believe, whereas this only accepts the timestamp in seconds. So we have to divide by a thousand. So I'm just going to do int message t divide by a thousand. Obviously, it has to be an integer, otherwise that would be a strange time stamp indeed. Although I actually haven't tried it without, so maybe we'll try that and see if it works as well. So now we need to create our record that we're going to insert. So I'm going to call that record to insert. And that's just going to be a tuple here. So it's going to be the timestamp, the symbol so remembering our schema for the messages the it's going to be message lowercase s we index into and then for the price it's going to be message lowercase p and then for the quantity it's just message lowercase q now we give the cursor the command that we want. So we combine this record that we've got here with the query. So we say cursor.execute query and the record to insert. And then finally we say connection.commit. And that will actually insert the record into the database. So if I run this, all things being well, we should start getting some data. Of course, it wouldn't be a Python video without some syntax errors. So it looks like I've forgot a bracket here. Let me just go put that in. So I opened the bracket here, but I didn't close it. Now that should work. So we can see, well, it doesn't seem to be throwing any errors out. And if we come in here to a back to our Postgres window, you can run a query. So like select star from raw trade data and then let's order it in descending order so order by time descending and we'll just say limit 10 so that we don't end up with the whole thing printing out so we can see if i print this out a few times we're actually getting data in which is lovely just to experiment i'm just going to see what happens if we try and use a non-integer timestamp here i'm interested Well, it seems to be working just fine. Let's see what happens in the database here. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have any problems using non-integer timestamps. So if you really want that extra millisecond level of precision, you can include that in here if that's important for your particular algorithms. So that's everything that we need to get up and running with a timescale DB instance to create our own Docker container running Timescale DB, how to take data from the Binance Spot network and insert that straight into the DB, which you can easily connect to the live net just by changing the keys here to real keys, how to get your tables set up in Postgres and how to query them. So in the next section, I'll be talking about continuous aggregates and how we can use them to automatically create open, high, low, close candles for us. In this section, we'll be diving into continuous aggregates and we'll be showing how we can use them to aggregate trade data, which we've taken from Binance, into open, high, low, close volume candles for any time frame that we want and how we can have that happen in the background automatically so we don't have to keep recalculating the candles over and over again or keep requesting them from a remote database. And so you get that perfect equilibria between having maximum accuracy because the candles will be up to date right to the last tick, right to the last trade. But at the same time, it's very quick because we don't need to recalculate everything every time. 
So I'll just show you the post on their website just so you can get an idea of roughly what the continuous aggregates look like. So you can think about your data down here. So you've got your raw data and you've got thousands of data points maybe in each one hour bucket. What Timescale will do behind the scenes is bucket this up and so it's going to grab all this data and extract out just the metric that you want. So it could be the average, the maximum, the minimum, and you do that on a per column basis. You start off by creating a materialized view in SQL. Just input regular old Postgres, meaning that it's a query that we can run and the database will save the results of that query. And when we get a batch of new data in, we can refresh that to reflect the new data that's come in. But with timescale, we can have that act on a timer automatically. And of course, it works with timescale's hyper table format, which lets us work with much bigger databases compared to the amount of memory that we actually have available on our machine. Because again, we only have to bring in those very small chunks into memory. So let's go ahead and just dig into the console now and we'll actually create some continuous aggregates. So just as a refresher here, if you didn't watch the last segment of the video, the way our database is set up is that we've got everything inside a Docker container here. So if I do Docker PS, you can see we have a timescale Docker container and I can enter that using this command here. So Docker exec dash IT, the name of your container. So mine's called tutorial two, and then the command. So PSQL as the Postgres user. You may need to adapt this if you've installed timescale in a different way. Then in the Postgres instance that we have, we have a table called raw trade data. And if I run this select statement here, you can see that it's pulling in lots of raw trades for ADA BTC and ETH BTC. And we've got four columns, the time, which is a timestamp, the symbol, which is a string, the price and the quantity, which are both doubles. So fairly straightforward schema, really. How do we create a materialized view from this, which we can then refresh regularly using timescale? You can find some nice examples on the timescale documentation here and create a continuous aggregate. This is roughly the syntax that we're going to be following. You create a materialized view, then you give the name of it. So this is, this is what you'll actually be querying. So when we're querying our database later on, it will be this name, whatever we decide to put there. And then we basically just have to select which columns that we want here. So if I go to our example that we'll be using, we're going to select the symbol and then the time. Notice that we're using the time bucket function here from timescale to bucket into one minute intervals. Obviously you can change that to wherever you like. You can do an hour, a day, a month. We're going to bucket on the time column and then we're going to give that an alias of date. And then we've got all our other aggregations here. So obviously we're using open, high, low, close volume here. So for open, we want to take the first in that particular time bucket. Then we want to take the max for high, the min for low, the last price for the closing price, and then obviously the sum for volume. So all that's happening is that it's splitting our data up into these little predefined buckets as we've selected and applying these functions to each of those buckets of data. So let's write our view here in the PSQL window. So we'll do create materialized view and then we'll give it a name. So I'll call mine open, high, low, close, data, minute. Then we'll want with timescale db.continuous as, and then we'll start specifying our columns here. So select symbol. And then we want time underscore buckets interval one minute time as dit. This 
first few lines here will look pretty similar no matter what sort of schema you've got going on. You'll generally have some sort of label for it. So in the example of uh, here, they had like a device, so maybe like a, a weather measuring device. Here we've got the symbol, so you'll have generally some kind of string based identifier, could be an integer maybe sometimes. And then you'll also have a time column, which we're actually looking to do the bucketing on. So this section here will look pretty much the same no matter what you're doing. Now we want to go ahead and just write our aggregation functions. So for the open column, we want to apply the first function, right? So if we've got a bucket of data, we've got all the trades happening in that one minute section. We just want to grab the first one and that's going to be the opening price for that candle. So price is the column that we're going to feed into it and then we need to give it the time column so it knows which column to look at for the time maybe if you had multiple time columns on the database it might get confused so we give it the time column here and then we're also going to give it an alias so all of the columns that we're going to be creating here we're going to be creating them as an aggregate of the price column so if they were all called price it would be very confusing so you can just give it another name. So I'm going to call mine open. And then similarly, we're just going to do maximum here of price. That's independent of time. It doesn't involve time. You don't need to know the times involved to calculate the maximum of the range. So you don't need to include time as a parameter there. That's going to be high. And then the min. Similarly, it's just the price as low. The Closing price is going to be basically the same as first here. So it's going to be last price time as close. And then finally, we're going to want the volume here. So the volume for the candle is just the sum of all the individual trades that happen during that time. So it's just the sum of quantity. And then that's going to be saved as volume. So we've defined all our columns here. If you have some extra column on there, you'll have to think about how you want to aggregate that or if you even want to include it in this aggregation at all. We just need to select our table that we're actually loading the data from here. So that's going to be from, in my case, raw underscore trade underscore data. And then the final statement is going to be a group by statement. And it's important to get the order right here. So the two columns which we're going to be grouping by are the time and the symbol. You can think about this as it's categorizing them by the two columns. So obviously we wouldn't want to apply the first function here, let's say, to every element in the table all at once. We want to separate it out by symbol. It makes no sense to include ADA data inside the ETH candles. So that's why we want to group by symbol here, because otherwise you'll end up with all sorts of crazy stuff with different symbols being included in your candles and the query might not even work. And then the second thing we want to group by is the date. So remember, we've time bucketed all these intervals here and we've called that column date. So that will produce a timestamp at the end of each bucket and the column will be called date and that's what we want to group things by. So we want to take all of the data we've got in here, all of the trades, and we want to organize it by symbol firstly, and then by time bucket. That's all this group by is saying at the end here, just if you're unfamiliar with how queries work and that kind of thing. So semicolon, remembering as always, and this should run nicely. Okay, so we've got this here. So this says refreshing continuous aggregate, open ILO close data minute. So I should be able to actually request some data from here now if I do a select statement. So select star from open ILO close data minute. If I run that, we do indeed get some candles. So you can see here it's grouped, as we said, by symbol and then by date, which is the order that we want things in. Now, let me refine this select statement here just so that we can get more granular data. So I'm going to request ETH data. So where symbol is equal to ETH BTC. I'm going to order it in descending order. So date descending. And I'm going to say a limit of 10. 
just so our entire screen doesn't fill up. So this is great. And we can see that every time we query it, it's actually updating this query. So it's pulling the most recent tick data here. So if I keep requesting it, you can see that the volume keeps increasing as it finds new trades. I've still got the streaming program running here. So it's still streaming in new trades. And so every time I refresh this, it's now coming up with new data. Now, this is great and all, but if you were to leave this running for maybe a few days, you notice a very, very considerable slowdown in this query. And the reason is we haven't actually added a refresh schedule in the background. So currently what it's doing is it did a singular refresh when we first called this. So if I can manage to scroll back enough here. So you can see it did a refresh here. And that was maybe at what six minutes past two. So maybe all the data up to this point has been aggregated and stored down in the database. But these candles here, the ones after six minutes past two, those are being calculated on demand when we run this query. Now it's fine to have a few candles like that, but if all of your candles are like that, you're not actually making use of the continuous aggregate. So we need to apply a refresh policy to make sure that once a few candles have gone by, it actually does the aggregation and saves it down to disk. That way you're not having to recompute everything every time on the fly when you request the data. This works really well for time series data because realistically, we're only inserting data in the last few candles. So it means that timescale doesn't even have to check these older candles because we're very unlikely to insert data more than a few minutes old really for our purposes. So let me show you how to go ahead and create a refresh policy. So we select add continuous aggregate policy. Really not an easy function to spell there. And then you want to provide the name of the continuous aggregate table. So don't say the name of the table where we stored our raw data. This is where you actually want to provide the name of our continuous aggregate table, which should be different. So insert that in there. And then there's a few parameters here that we'll want. These are not amazingly well explained on the documentation. So I'll provide a brief summary here. So the start offset, which is the first parameter, start underscore offset. Now that is the time at which it will look back to. So how far is it looking back for new insertions into the database? So we're going to give that an interval and you can put whatever you want in here. Um, it's recommended to do two bucket widths at least. So in our case, that would be two minutes. But I'm going to set it to five minutes. I don't think it will struggle with that. You know, if you're dealing with obscene amounts of data, maybe you want to optimize this a little bit more. But essentially what that means is that every time this policy runs, it's going to look at the previous five buckets. And if there's been any changes to the data, or maybe that bucket is entirely new, it's going to aggregate that and save the results down to disk for us. End offset is the complement of that, so end offset. And what end offset is going to do is this is the cutoff point for the most recent data it's going to look at. So we can say one min. So basically, if we set the policy like this, it's not going to look at any data newer than one minute. And that kind of makes sense. There's, there's no real point looking at that data because we might not be able to aggregate it necessarily. Timescale needs to span the full bucket width before it can actually do anything. This parameter isn't too important. The main thing is just to make sure that you've got several bucket widths in this interval here. That's the main thing you want to think about. The next and the final parameter is the schedule interval. Now this one's fairly straightforward. This is just how often you want to run the aggregation here. You can set this to basically be as often as you want, although you're not going to get any benefit if you set it to be quicker than every bucket. 
So I'm just going to set it to one bucket width. And then that should be good. Although I have misspelled minutes here, so we'll see if it runs. It did run. It recognized that that meant minutes, so that's good. And now what happens is that we actually don't suffer any degradation of performance over time in our continuous aggregate here. So no matter how long I leave this running for, we'll always be able to grab this table with all of our minute data. And it'll be very, very, very quick. And yet still accurate to the tick because every time we get a new piece of data coming in, this view can automatically compute our aggregates for just the most recent candle and all the other results have been saved down to disk. So I hope that makes sense. This is a really cool feature of Timescale DB. It's probably my favorite feature. Really useful if you've got some kind of database and then you want to create some indicators based off that, but you need candlesticks. And you could even go as far as to automatically calculate the indicators themselves using some kind of continuous aggregate. There's an awful lot of stuff you can do with this data. So obviously I've made a continuous aggregation for the one minute data. You can actually make multiple continuous aggregates for each underlying table. So I could make one for hourly data and for daily data and for monthly data. That way, when I want to have monthly candles, I don't have to go and compute each and individual item. You'll have to strike a balance in your own system between how much data you want to store and how quick you want your queries to be. So if I want the five minute candles here, I will have to request the one minute candles, then aggregate them myself. But that's a thousand times quicker than aggregating all the trades manually. One final thing that we might want to do with this database here is to add a retention policy. So this depends on the nature of your trading system. And especially if you're ingesting a lot of data, you might well want to remove some of the older data that you're not using, or at least remove it from your database. You could keep it locked up in block storage somewhere for backtesting and whatnot. But we might want to add a retention policy. And to do that, all you have to do is use this function here. So add retention policy. And you just select the name of your table. So you can either use this one or the raw trades underneath. For my use case, I'm going to add a retention policy to the raw trade data. The reason why I might want to do this is that I'm creating all these continuous aggregates here based off the raw trade data. And maybe after the first couple of days, I don't actually need access to this data anymore. I'm only using the candles. And so it might be a good idea to just get rid of this data I'm not really using. As long as you set up your refresh policy properly for the continuous aggregate, these candles will continue to remain in the database as long as it's before the end offset, even if the underlying data here is deleted. So I'm going to add an interval of, say, 10 days in here. I only want to store 10 days of raw trade data. And there we go. So after 10 days, it will start deleting the oldest trade data, but our candles will still remain in the database. Unless, of course, you add another retention policy and delete them that way. So that's pretty much everything you need to know to get started as far as continuous aggregates go in timescale, specifically for use in algo trading and how we might use them to speed up our queries by pre-computing certain values that we might need from a larger set, aggregating that down into a much smaller table, which we can then request from our trading bot. I'll be showing you how we can actually pull this data into the Python bot itself in a second. I'll be using an example from my blog, which you can find at greyhoundanalytics.com. In particular, it'll be this one, and you can find the code at the bottom here in the GitHub if you want to follow along exactly with what I'm doing in the tutorial. So without further ado, let's get going. Now that we've got our timescale DB set up, we're streaming all the data that we need from Binance. 
we've aggregated it into candlesticks that we're then going to use to calculate our indicators. Let's go ahead and actually integrate that with a Python bot. To show you how this works in practice, how you can retrieve data from your timescale instance. It's all well having the data in there, but if you can't get to it, it's no good. So I'll be using a tutorial that I've done previously. So I'll, I'll leave a link to the blog in the description and at the bottom here, you can find a link to the GitHub code. So if you want to just follow along with the tutorial, you should just be able to copy and paste this code and it should work pretty much exactly as I'm going to show here. In fact, I will just copy and paste this and work from this during this tutorial. So if I go grab the raw copy here and I'll go paste that into Vim. There we go. So I'll just go back over to GitHub here and just give you a rough explanation of how the code works just so that we can switch out the bits that we need to. So it's currently using the REST API in order to fetch some clients. Clients just being the Binance term for candlestick data. So we can see here there's a call to client.get historical clients, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, you feed in a particular asset that you'd like. We convert that to a data frame and then we pass that data frame out as the returned variable. So this is actually the only function that we need to replace. If you have some kind of trading bot that you've got running that's currently using a REST API, you'll really only need to change your data retrieval function in order to upgrade that to using your own database, which it'll probably be a factor of 10 to even 100x better depending on how efficient your database is and what the network latency is like to the exchange you're using. So really, the focus of this section is going to be just on this function and how we convert this to getting data from our local database rather than getting data from the REST API. I'd recommend grabbing the code here so that you can mess around with it, but if you've got your own bot or you can even just open a blank Python file and practice pulling in the data yourself without any of this extra bot code. The bot code is just there to show you how this works in practice. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So let's go back to our Python file over here and we'll scroll up to where we have our fetch clients function. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm actually just going to comment out everything else in this file. So using three quotes like that, you can make a multi-line string. So I can comment out everything from that point onwards. It's not highlighting with the syntax, but I'm sure it'll work. Okay, and then we'll call fetch clients afterwards here. So we'll say, well, we'll print out the results. So we'll do fetch clients, and then we'll just pass in BTC or ETH BTC, since that's the pair that we're scraping from the WebSocket, ETH BTC. And then if we just run this, it should function the variable names should be the same as the one that we're using. So if I just run that, of course, I've gone out of our virtual environment here. So I can probably just use this one that I used earlier. There's no new libraries or anything that we're installing. It's just, you can use the same environment you used before. So let's go back to our tutorial. And if I run this now, we'll see that it took a few seconds but it's gone ahead and grabbed all of this candlestick data for the BTC ETH pair. As you can see, this is testnet data, so the price is just not changing for like 10 minutes, but that's fine, we're only testing this. So instead of using this REST data, let's go ahead and plug this into our database. First thing we need to do is we just need to, well, we need to import PsychoPG first. So import PSY COPG2. If you need to install that, by the way, if you didn't see the previous tutorial, you install it with pip using PsychoPG2 dash binary. It's important to get the dash binary in there. So if you do pip install PG2 binary, 
If you just try and install Psycho Bean U2, it won't work too well. It'll try to build it on your system and it'll break horribly, or at least it does for me. So make sure you import that module. And then we'll create a connections object here. So if I do connection is equal to Psycho PG2 dot PG2 dot connects. And then we need to specify our username, our password, various other things. So if you're using some kind of managed database, if you've got this your database on some kind of cloud server, make sure you put those details in rather than the ones I'm using here. The details that I'll be using are the ones that are default for Docker installations. So if you've made any changes to your config, make sure the connect object reflects that here. So the user is just going to be Postgres. The password, well, we're going to get that from our config and that's going to be db underscore pass. Then the host is just going to be our local system. So 127.0.0.1. The port is going to be 5432. If you remember our docker run command, that's the port that we bound. And then the database itself is just called Postgres. That's the default database. Now, I'm going to have to go quickly grab our database password. I had that saved in an ENV file in a different folder. So if I go back up here into here, or even in here, see the .env file, I'll grab this and I'll paste it in our ENV file. If you're just messing around, you can of course just type the password straight in here, but Using Python decouple just makes your life a lot simpler because you don't have to worry about anyone else getting access to this code. It's got no sensitive information in it. And that's why I use Python decouple. So now that we've got this, we should be able to create a cursor object. And that's going to be equal to connection.cursor. So this is the object that we're going to use to actually execute any of our commands to the database. If I click our go button here, basically we're just looking for that the, the connection actually ran. So if you've got some kind of error there, that would have probably shown up when we press go there. So we're now ready to actually start typing in our query here. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get rid of this nonsense here. Um yeah, get rid of that, get rid of that, just get rid of everything, and we'll write this again from scratch. So our fetch clients function here. So we need to define a query that we're going to query our database with. This is done as a string. So we, we create a string which represents the query that you would normally do in a regular SQL prompt. So for example, in here, I can say, you know, uh, select star, select every column from open high low close where symbol is equal to ETBTC, order by this, so on and so forth. And that produces me this. So basically, we need to just take this and put it in a string. So let's go ahead and do that. So you can do this in a few ways. The way on the documentation that they do it is they use triple quotes. So you can do select star. So select all the columns from open high, low close, underscore data, underscore minutes. That's the name of the table I use. And then you want to have a where clause. So we're only after data from a particular asset. So it's going to be where symbol is equal to. Now, you don't want to type the symbol name directly in here. That makes you prone to sort of injection attacks because you can't validate the keywords. What we do instead is we put a placeholder here, so, so a percent %s, and we replace that with the value when we actually execute the command. So where symbol is equal to percent %s, and then we'll order that by date descending. So that means the most recent data will come first. That's date descending order. And the reason we do that is so that we can do this. So limit 50. So what that will do is it will grab the first 50 elements and then it'll cut it off. This is a relatively efficient way of grabbing the most recent 50 candles or so. Because timescale has indexed everything by time, it's very efficient at doing these sort of date ascending, descending orderings. 
and it can just grab the first 50 indexes. You could do something like select, you know, where um, date is is less than or equal to, you know, some date time value here, and you'd pass that in like this. And then the problem is you'd have to calculate exactly what you want this value of date to be. So then we have to import date time to, yeah, it's just, it's just a bit of a headache, but you can go for that approach if you want. But for us, we just need a limited number of candles. We're just calculating an RSI value and we're only using the most recent one. So 50 candles is overkill, if anything. But if you don't include this last little statement here, so the order by the limit, it'll just keep requesting every single element where the symbol is equal to the symbol that you've chosen. And you know, if your table's gigabytes and gigabytes, that's gonna be real, real slow. So do make sure to include this in your query. Okay, so we've got that. Now, pretty much all we need to do here is activate the cursor here. So we'll do cursor dot execute. And then query. And then you need to provide the parameters here. So you provide them in the form of a tuple. So I'm just going to say assets. And then in order to let Python know that this is a tuple, you have to put a comma there. That would be to distinguish it from using brackets as a precedence operator. So rather than saying, you know, we want to do brackets first, we're actually passing in asset as a member of a tuple here. So once we've done that, we can now return our values here. So cursor.fetch all. And if we run that, we should get some data back. Now, this is somewhat of an incomprehensible mess, but I'll try and pass it out for you. So we've got a list of tuples here. So we've got the symbol, the date, along with all its time zone information, and then the open, high, low, close volume. So since we selected star, that selected every single column and we get it in the same order every single time. So for our purposes, we don't actually need all of this data. So I'm just gonna request date and the closing price. So if I run this again, you can see we've now just got the date and the closing price much easier. Now pandas should be able to automatically ingest this list here. So let's go to here and let's make sure we've imported pandas. So we have, we've got pandas as PD there. Make sure you import pandas and install it if you need to. And then instead of doing that, what we can do here is we can just say data is equal to cursor dot fetch all. And then on the next line, we'll say df is equal to pd dot data frame. Make sure you capitalize it correctly. We'll pass in data and then we'll pass in the name of the columns here. So columns is equal to the first one's going to be the time. And then oh, we could call it date, I guess, to keep it consistent. And then the second one is going to be the close. I guess we really want to look at what our next function is doing. So the clients here gets passed into get RSI. So this expects a column with the name price. So I'll just to keep things consistent, I'll call it price. And then if I return df, let's see what happens here. So this is way nicer than the previous format, at least for us mere mortals to read. The final thing that we'll really want to do with this is to sort this in ascending order rather than descending order. This obviously depends on how exactly you're calculating your indicators. But generally speaking, when you're calculating indicators, say a moving average, you go from top to bottom. So the 14 candle moving average will use these 14 candles and print out the value here. Now for us, that's not going to work too well because the data is sort of back to front as it were, as an artifact of the method which we used to select the data. Fairly easy to fix that since we've got this in date time format. All we have to do is say df.sort underscore values by equals, then you select the date column and then in place is equal to true. So that it actually changes the data frame itself. Click go. 
And there we go. We've got we've got things in ascending order rather than descending order now, which is exactly what we're after. Again, this depends on exactly how you're calculating your indicators. If your indicator function already accounts for this, maybe you don't need to worry about it. But so now if we get rid of this and we open this up, so we get rid of our quotes here, this should now work pretty much. Looks like we don't actually have any data in our database for BTC USDT. I didn't actually include that as a parameter when we were streaming, so I'll use ETH BTC instead. And that should solve the problem. There we go. You can see it's spitting out the RSI and it'll just continue to do that until it reaches an RSI of maybe 30 and then it'll buy. And then when it gets to 70, it'll sell, etc., etc. But the main thing is that it's actually working and calculating as expected. You could cross-reference this with the actual Binance trading window. I'm fairly confident it's working. It seems to be spitting out more reasonable values, but we can always check. Although do remember that this again is testnet data, so it might not look exactly the same. The prices are liable to be a bit all over the place. So that's everything I wanted to show you today involving Timescale DB for your algo trading projects, how you can use it to speed up your execution times, and you can have your own private repository of past price action that you can then backtest against with no worries about latency, or getting rate limited or having to pay extra for the data, etc, etc. If you made it this far in the video, congratulations. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two about using Timescale. If you want to check out the source code for everything that I used in this video, you can check the links in the description to my blog at greyhoundanalytics.com. There you'll find all of the source code and I'll try and keep the blog posts up to date just in case there's any API changes. You'll be able to check there. You'll also be able to find my contact details in case you want to get in touch. And so I hope you found this video really helpful in your projects and use it to great success in trading the markets.